the season. So our first speaker is uh, James Kimmel from uh, University of Vienna. The interesting thing about James is that he's actually from Christchurch. And last time I was in uh, Central Europe, right, James sent me an email saying, "Listen, I'm from New Zealand and I live over here, and uh, you live and, and you're from over here and I <laughs> live in, and live there." And so anyway, so we had a really nice uh, lunch and, and a few beers, followed by a few beers, right? We thought it's fun. Out and James said that uh, he would be visiting his family in uh, February. And so, you know, uh, thank you for letting us know. It's a pleasure to have you over here. Uh, we're very curious what you're working on. Okay, well, thanks for spending the last sunny afternoon of your holidays in my sauna. Um, I'm, pre I'm presenting this, uh, uh, some results from an experiment I ran almost two years ago now. And it, it took us a while to sort of get things into shape because. Uh, we got exactly the opposite results to what we expected. And I, I think now we've finally made some sense of it. Um, this is the first time I'm presenting um, it in its current format, so I'll be very interested to know what you think. Um, but hopefully it's, it's drawing to a close, this, this particular project. Um, I did it with a couple of co-authors, Chloe Lecoq uh, in Stockholm, and Alexander Wagner, who's at the University of, of Constance. Uh, so the paper is about social preferences and bounded rationality in the centipede game. Um, so an outline of the talk, it's going to have a slightly strange format because, as I said, we didn't get the results we expected. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll start off um, reminding you of the centipede game and go over a bit of the related literature and sort of try to motivate uh, the experiment uh, and explain the, the hypothesis related to, to social preferences. Um, I'll go over the experimental design, show you the results, and which clearly reject our initial hypothesis. Um, then I'll introduce this thing called prospective reference theory, um, which is the model um, which we've used to sort of organize the data and give us a good idea of what actually seems to be going on um, uh, in the data. And then draw a few conclusions and discuss the implications beyond the centipede game. I think there's sort of some more general um, implications related to uh, group identity, uh, the literature on, on discrimination and uh, uh, also about rationality in general. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, first of all, how long do I have? Um, normally you'll have four thirty. Okay, that's including questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, okay, so the centipede game, uh, hopefully, well, you've probably seen it um, before at some point in your career. Uh, it's a two-player game, an uh, extensive form game. Uh, at each decision node, the player has a choice of either continuing or stopping. Um, if they choose to stop, uh, they get a, a, a payoff, their partner gets a payoff as well. If they continue, um, the other player gets to make a decision. It alternates backwards and forwards. Now, they, they come in lots of different forms, but the, the basic structure of the centipede game is such that um, you should continue if and only if the other player will continue at least once after you. Um, and at the last node, the player has an incentive to stop rather than continue. And what this leads to, if you solve this uh, game using backward induction, uh, it leads to a, a unique subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. Okay, so if you um, look at the last decision node, the second player has a choice between 64 and 128, so obviously we'll choose to stop. Um, player number one now knows that player two will stop, um, so has a choice between 32 points or 64, where you don't decide to stop. Going back to the, the previous node, um, player number two, knowing that player number one is going to stop at the next node, they have a choice between 16 or 32, so they will choose to stop, and so on and so forth, right back to the first decision node, um, where the first player knows that the second player will stop at the next node, so given the choice between two and four, they will stop at the first node. Um, so this leads to this very counter intuitive um, outcome, where uh, the payoffs are 4 and 1, uh, when the 
if they continue right to the end, they could multiply this perhaps by 64. Uh, but given selfish uh, preferences and um, common knowledge of rationality, uh, the, the, the only um, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is, 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 is outcome here. Okay, so that's, that's the theory. Um, that's the standard game theory um, analysis of, of this game. So what happens in experiments? Um, typically, most, in most experiments, um, the game continues to node 4 or 5. Uh, a few people play the, the Nash, um, but usually a very, very small number. Uh, and there are people who choose to continue, who do in fact choose to continue uh, at the final node, even though they're clearly choosing, there's no chance of them getting a, a higher payoff. So the two um, sort of leading explanations for this, the deviations from the background induction solution, are social preferences and limited cognition. So you're taking questions at the end or during the... Sorry? You're taking questions only at the end or during your talk? Uh, I'd rather just do clarification now uh, for this part, because I really want to get to the... Sure. the, um, the uh, That's okay. So, I, can, yeah. I can be quiet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't get stuck halfway through and only present the first half of it, because the second half is what's interesting for me. Um, yeah, so the, the well, the, one of the earliest experimental um, treatments of this was by McKelvey and Palfrey in 1992. Uh, the theory for their experiment, they assumed that there was a certain fraction of altruists and um, they used the sort of the new concept at the time, uh, quantal response equilibria. Um, but they, they never really tested for social preferences. They just, um, they have this theory and they said yes, it's, it's sort of more or less consistent with the data in the sense that People don't always play Nash because they're either altruists or they uh, are pretending to be altruists, or uh, and so on. Um, most of most of the papers have used some form of bounded rationality to explain um, to explain this deviation from the, the Nash equilibrium. Um, so there are a few papers here. Um, this one, Palacios, Suerte, and Volich. Um, they, they uh, assume that, it was, that the reason people don't play the Nash equilibria is simply the, that they're incapable of doing Nash uh, backward induction. So um, they ran some experiments at chess tournaments. They sort of hypothesized that chess players could do backward induction better than um, ordinary people. And indeed, they found that grandmasters almost always played the Nash equilibria. Um, and masters tended to, to play it more often, and so on and so forth. Um, so Levitt List and Sadov tried to replicate this, but didn't succeed in doing that. Bornstein, yeah. uh, third paper, Bornstein uh, and his co-authors, they were testing the hypothesis that uh, group uh, decisions made in groups tended to be more rational than decisions made by uh, individuals. They found some support for that. Um, then you've got the agent quantum response equilibria, uh, where it's just assumed that agents make mistakes sometimes, um, and this is taken into account. You know, you know that other people are making mistakes, so you get this, this concept. There's been some level K models, um, experiments based on that, and also people have looked at learning in the centipede game. Um, so Nigel and Tang, they they found that there was some learning, and that people tended to finish earlier as they became more familiar with the game. But they didn't find that it, they there was sort of convergence to the Nash equilibrium. That in, the, the, yeah, it, was, it wasn't clear that, that, that this was going to happen at all. They did 50 repetition, repetitions, I think. So. Um, so our motivation was was just to you know take social preferences seriously as, as a possible explanation for why people weren't playing playing Nash, and this um, this is the first first time it's really been taken seriously as a 
as a possibility in an experimental um, design. So the idea was to alter the effect of social preferences without changing the effect of limited cognition. So um, what we did was we induced group identity. And there's all this literature showing that if you're playing someone from the same group as yourself, you tend to be more altruistic, you tend to reciprocate more, you tend to care more about social welfare maximization and so on and so forth. Um, so our hypothesis was that if social preferences play a role, then strengthening nice, nice social preferences should uh, lead players to continue longer and move the distribution of stopping nodes to the right. So if you're altruistic and care more about the powers of other players, the more this is the case, the more attractive of, um, outcomes to the right become. On the other hand, if you become more envious of, of uh, if envy becomes a factor and that your partner's power enters negatively into a utility function, you're going to stop earlier. Um, social welfare maximization, clearly, uh, uh, the more you care about that, the, the, the more you're going to be likely to continue. And reciprocity as well. Um, by continuing, um, the other player has given you an opportunity to get a higher points. So to reciprocate, the way you, you do this is by continuing yourself. So all the nice social preferences, altruism, reciprocity, social welfare maximization, they all lead you to continue longer. And negative social preferences like envy cause you to stop earlier. Yes? Are you going to come back to this idea of just what you said about social preferences influencing uh, what it looks like to be just the mean of the distribution as opposed to the entire distribution, or do you want to leave that for later? Um, we can leave that for later. It's quite fine if you want to keep going. It's okay. Well, actually, the results is uh, uh, stochastically dominated. So, I mean, it doesn't, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's not something I'm going to come back to this. But, um, uh, Yes, so that was that was our hypothesis. So if you are playing with an in-group player, because these nice social preferences are, are strengthened, uh, if you play with, with someone from your own group, you should continue longer. And if you play with someone from the other group, um, which has been shown to increase envy and all these negative social preferences, you should stop earlier. This was our hypothesis. Okay, so what did we do? Um, so we used this uh, social this group identity manipulation that was used by Chen and Lee in a uh, paper in 2009. Um, and in this paper, they show that they play a whole series of games um, which show pretty clearly that um, all these things are true, which I've said in the past. When, that, when you play with in-groups, you're more altruistic, you reciprocate more, you care more about social welfare and so on and so forth. If you're playing an out-group player, you will tend to be more envious of the so we, we follow them exactly, well, almost. Uh, what happens is participants take preferences over five pairs of paintings that look something like this. You ask, do you like the one on, on the left or the one on the right? You do this with five pairs like this, and based on those uh, preferences, you're um, assigned to a group, either the Klee group or the Kandinsky group, uh, depending on whether you you preferred, you're more likely to prefer um, paintings by Klee or, or Kandinsky. Uh, then they chatted for a bit um, online, discussing uh, another pair of paintings. They had to guess which one was by Klee and which one was by Kandinsky. Yes. I thought of the background when they were trying out. Were there any other demographic things that correlated with like one had to be more than the other, or was it just kind of random? It's pretty so random. Large? It's pretty random. I mean, all the, all the painting pairs are like this kind of stuff. I mean, now I can tell the difference between Klee and Kandinsky. Um, but, yeah. And, and it, it doesn't influence behavior either. So, yeah. So they, they're not interacting in person with their. No, it's all anonymous. It's all, it's all online. Um, so this is just about 
separating people into groups and inducing some kind of feeling of, of group identity. And it's been shown as a said in the past to have these effects on social preferences. Um, they then played the centipede game I showed you before. Um, before they before they start, they're informed about their own player type and which group they're in. So all, all they know about their um, partner is which group they're either the same group or a different group. Uh, we use the strategy method. Question again. Yes. Um, did you do check as uh, Jenna did? Do. Uh, did they check prior to making any decisions? Because in the, in the, in the area, are they? Yeah, they checked. They checked. So people in their own group. Right. Only in their own group. Did you have that as well? Yes. Yes, we did it. Yes, we did. Yeah. Because there's a sort of, the, the, the chat turned, I mean, turned some magic on, right? and, and things just happened. Well, nobody knows why. So, so I was wondering if you guys had it, and, 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 and I wanted to see the data. Okay. I, I don't think it's important. I mean, you see all these sort of group identity experiments where people are explicitly randomly put into groups, and there's still, you still observe these. These effects on social it depends, on, it depends on how on the um, degree of strategic interaction. Okay. Right. So if it is, if I don't care about what what, what you do, or if, if I know that I'm not going to be tracking with you within, within the group, right, then the effect could be very strong. As uh, in these first uh, group identity experiments, right, where yeah. as they observe psychologists. Yeah. Right? Um, but then if you introduce sort of if you introduce strategic interaction, right, then chat seems to turn some magic on, right? That it just okay. the things kicks in. Uh, I've seen some experiments. In fact, I have one. So it just chat or is that chat is that face to face or it's it's online chat. Uh, in um, what what we did, we had them discuss trivia or answers to trivia questions. So there was some sort of help form, right? So it's a psychologist called generalized reciprocity. Right. And this seems to turn on these social uh, preferences towards in group members in strategic environments. Anyway, so this is sorry. Sure. Yep. Um, okay, so yeah, we, we use the strategy method. So rather than play it sequentially, um, uh, each person, well, I'll show you how it was implemented. Um, you saw a a uh, screen like this it was run in Constance, which is why it's in German. Um, it, it says obviously you're in the Kandinsky group. Um, then if you were at this node, would you choose to stop or to continue? So that's how we, we implement it. And so we, we asked them at each node, so we got a full uh, strategy vector. Um, so we have a decision at each node. The reason we did this, uh, we did the strategy method because doubles the number of observations you have. Because um, if, if a player stops at the first node, you, you don't learn anything about what their partner would have done. So we double the number of observations. And uh, the, the reason we do it like this is rather than just giving them an, uh, an option of four, would you stop it here, 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 or here, we wanted to try and make it as close to playing it uh, sequentially as possible to, because there's a, a worry that with the uh, the strategy method, you don't sort of, it's less likely to induce sort of social preferences. Yeah. You don't have the sort of pots, uh, what they call it, something or other. Yeah. So we wanted to make it feel like they're playing it for real. Uh, yeah, so you, you answer these three questions at each of your decision nodes, but you stop or continue. Um, we also elicited beliefs um, about the population behavior of their match partner type. So the, they were asked to guess at each node. You're told, okay, that there are 12 people um, playing in your partner's role. Of those 12 people, how many, how many do you think would have chosen to stop at this node? And they asked that at each of their partner's nodes. Why? Uh, to, uh, so this is about listing the beliefs that the, part, the subjects have about the probability that their partner is going to stop at the next node. Because really to 
to um, judge whether uh, people are exhibiting social preferences, you need to know about their beliefs, not just their actions. So if if I believe that if I'm player number one and I believe that this player is going to stop with probability one here, and I choose to continue, that's a completely different thing to if I believe with probability one that they're going to continue here. So we need to know about beliefs as well. Yeah. And were any of those like implemented with a strong incentive, or were they basically just questions? Oh, no, this was incentivized. So if you get it correct. If, if your guess is the same as the population guess, you get 100 points or something. Is the same as the population guess, or your guess is the same as the population's answer in the prior stage? You're asking people what, what, for, what would the people in your group do with this? No, in the prior experiment, in the Oh, it was all done simultaneously. Yeah. So, so you, you're not, you don't know anything until after, after this. Yeah. So first of all, you, you give your strategy for actions, then your beliefs about what the other people of your partner's type did, yeah. and then it's for, and then you're matched with someone to find out how many points you got. Okay. And you also, um, uh, it's calculated whether your guesses were correct or not, so whether or not you get uh, paid for your belief at the station. So that's was especially, yes, it was incentivized. Okay, so we had 96 subjects, 24 subjects per session, using Z tree. It's about 45 minutes with average earnings of 8.6 euros for the 2 euro sharp fee. Um, okay, so these are the results. Basically, we got exactly the opposite of what we expected. Um, so if you remember, we were predicting that the in-group distribution should look something like this, and the out-group should look something like that, and you get more or less than opposite. So the in-groups, the, the games tended to finish earlier in the in-group um, treatment, and continue longer in the out-group treatment. Is collusion ruled out here? Well, uh, in what sense? They can't. They can't communicate. Join up at the end, take the payoffs, it's confusing. Well, they don't know who they're playing with. It's, they're all sitting behind computers. They, they, they oh, can't okay. identify. All they know about their partner is whether they're from the same group or a different group. That's the only... Well, I know they're in the same room somewhere. That's all. Um, so, yeah. The main hypothesis is not supported by the data. There were substantial payoff differences. So out groups, um, 58 points on average, compared with 35 points for in groups on average. If you break it down by strategies, again, you see the same thing. This is combining player ones and player twos. So the out groups, you know, the distribution is further to the right, the in group further to the left, which is the opposite of what we predicted. And it's true as well if you break it down by player type. And with these sorts of numbers of players, how big of a difference can you perceive? These are not significant at the 5% level. Uh, I think this one was at the 10% level. Um, but, yeah, I'm not claiming anything about significance at this stage, um, just that we can pretty clearly reject our initial hypothesis. Um, uh, which way do I go? That way. Okay, so as I said, you know, we need to know something about beliefs, because it could be that beliefs are changed by this um, group identity manipulation as well. So, if, but if you look at the belief data, they're pretty much the same. So, these numbers here, are the average, well, the averages of the number of players that um, the player thought were going to stop at the subsequent at, at that given node. So this is player one. They thought on average that one and a third uh, out of twelve people would stop at the second node. Um, three and a half at the at the fourth node and seven point two nine at the sixth node. Um, How many nodes was there again? Seven or six? Uh, six decision nodes, but there are seven outcomes, obviously, because you can continue and stop at the last one. Um, and if you look at these, there's, they're very close. There's no discernible pattern. Like sometimes uh, the in-group in treatment, they think fewer people will stop. Sometimes they think more people will stop. If you look at the standard deviations, there's not much difference either. So there doesn't seem to be there's not any significant difference in either the average number they think are going to stop at the next node, 
or the um, or the variance. So we've got no no difference in beliefs, but there seems to be some kind of difference in actions, but in the opposite direction to what we hypothesized. So we just had a hypothesis that social preferences explain behavior and sympathy gain by using group identity treatment. Um, but they're not, uh, social preferences are not a satisfactory explanation. Um, so so I guess the problem here is you're building this based upon the assumption that they are bonding with their group yeah. because there's an AER paper that says they did it. Mm -hmm. And so obviously it's only a test to the extent that that assumption is correct. And do you have anything layered on here that would help you to address that assumption? No. Uh, all I have is the AER paper and, and I've, I've run uh, I, I've run the same manipulation before and played dictator games and found uh, much higher altruism towards favoritism towards in groups. I mean, I, I've run this treatment myself. Clean, can this be Clear, exactly the same. Um, just add too much cost and time to say, okay, well, start with that group identity because you know, they already have the AER. Start with then putting the game that they use in the AER to the, the talent use group identity effect to see whether it continued in your sample of people and then add on the sense people. Then you should sure. show that. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a failure of our model, it's just that they never, they never gave the same kind of social preferences that they have in the AAR paper, so we can't say anything with that. Maybe the AAR paper is wrong. Well, as I said, you know, the, 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 I, I've done this myself in Frankfurt. Uh, it was a different subject pool, but Germans, um, so it's not, it's not necessarily uh, sure. a cultural sure. thing. Um, you know, I, you know, having seen it in the AAR paper and done it myself from, in a German speaking environment and found strong strong uh, effects on altruism, I didn't see any reason not to believe it would happen. I, I, I think it has to be Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's the same program, exactly the same program that I, I used in my previous one, so, yeah. It's just particularly obvious, and you have that Eric's um, question, so the in-group uh, numbers are roughly the same for the E and for the other one. The, the in-group numbers are pretty much the same. The number of subjects. The, Within the groups, so for pre, uh, pre and group, pre and third, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, so just to, just. Oh uh, no no no, it's so there, uh, uh, I guess. Uh, okay. I haven't. Yeah, it's just this. I can't remember. Uh, I probably should have. I'm not sure. I can't say for sure. Just With a case of give you some uh, evidence that. Yeah, although, yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, I did test this with my previous uh, experiment, which was on the coalition formation, using the same uh, group identity manipulation, and there, I, as I said, I, I found people definitely favored the in-group, um, and I uh, tested all the, all the obvious things, but there was any correlation between behavior and which group you were in, and found nothing. And also the Chinnaly paper, they look at behavior and there's a correlated with which group you choose, and they find it's not. So uh, I haven't done it very thoroughly with this data, but. The people in Austria and Vienna are happy for you to run experiments on Germans trying to induce more in group behavior and in group <laughs> preferences. Uh, this was actually, this was done in. Um, Constance. I was a bit worried because that like, Klee and Kandinsky, like Klee is a very German name, Kandinsky is not so much, and I was a bit worried about whether this would make a difference. So I spoke to some Germans and they, they didn't seem to think it would be a, an issue. Because obviously, obviously in America, probably no one's heard of Klee or Kandinsky, but in Germany there's a chance. That, but, but actually, you know, I, I did ask a question, I, I, you know, how familiar are you with these artists? And most, even most of the German students have not Heard of Klee or Kandinsky? What about the psychology literature? Hmm? Uh, how much? Yeah, yeah those are sort of first, second year students, so they don't know much about anything really. Uh, yep, so yeah, we got the, the changes in strategies are the opposite of what we would have predicted if social preferences were of primary importance, and they continue, they tend to continue longer without groups. Um, considering beliefs does not change this. So there doesn't seem to be any treatment difference in beliefs. 
Um, so overall, if there is an impact of social preferences, it's outweighed by some other force. I mean, it's really hard to, given the, the, the strength of the, the, the quantity of literature in the past, suggesting that this, this group identity manipulation affects social preferences, it's really hard to say, no, it doesn't. Um, so we're not claiming that, we're just saying that it is, if, if, if it is a factor, it's outweighed by something else. Did you have a question? Yeah, I, I'm trying to get this connection of the relation between your hypothesis and the, the results. And what I think I understand is that when you look at the, uh, there's a pattern in the beliefs at node two and at node four and at node six, and you know, whether you're type one or type two, that sort of thing, right? Okay. And so you, so you look at that pattern and you're, and, and uh, the, what I'm wondering is, is the behavior the social preference behavior at node six and the social preference behavior at node four and the social preference behavior at node two. Are you kind of discriminating at that fine detail or are you just looking at uh, social preferences kind of across the whole, um, uh, you know, did they arrive at the national equilibrium or not versus what did they do at node two given that they had these expectations? What did they do at node four given that they had these expectations? What did they do at node six given that they expected the next node, you know, nine of the 12 people to, uh, to uh, not continue? Does that make sense? Like in terms of assessing, okay, at node six, if I'm, I, I'm in player one, and there's about seven, or, seven, eight, or nine, I'm expecting these guys to stop yeah. at the next round. Now, given that expectation, what would the social preference be? To keep going? Uh, well, it, it depends on the strength. Of it, right? if, if, if you're very altruistic, you, you would be more likely to continue. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but anyway, like for, for a given for a given belief, for any for any given belief, you're more likely to continue if your nice social preferences are strong. Yeah, but if I was a rep, if I mean I don't know whether these are these are obviously the average across a bunch of player one times, but if I if I was an individual an altruistic individual person, could you look at that sequence of things? What did they do at number two? What did they do at number four? Or what did we do at number two? What did we do at number four? Oh yeah, sure, sure. I mean, yeah, sort of yeah. No, the connection will come in the next model. In fact, I, I, I can tell you what I did at first. I, I did some probit regressions looking at the probability of continuing given the belief about the probability of stopping at the next node. Yeah. Uh, so this was my initial approach. And I, what I found was that um, uh, the connection between beliefs and well, the slope of the response to your belief was much flatter for the outgroups. But we'll, we'll, get, oh, into, yeah. we'll get to this. We'll get to this. I, I'm, I'm making a connection between, you know, between individual beliefs and individual actions. Very soon. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's going to come. Okay. Uh, okay. So we rejected that hypothesis, and um, found that this model of uh, Rationality works very well, so I'll explain it. Uh, prospective reference theory. So, just to give you a bit of background to this kind of theory, um, so expected utility theory was the norm for, or probably still is, of how we you know, look at how people make decisions uh, under risk and uncertainty. And um, but in, in, in many circumstances, people don't treat probabilities as, as objective, as, as they should in expected utility theory. So a few examples are very unlikely events are given too much weight, uh, very likely events are given insufficient weight. Um, so what this means is if, if you're told that something's going to happen with 1% probability, you act as though it would happen with 5% probability. If you're told that something's 99% sure going to happen, you act as though it's only 95% sure. Okay. Um, there's also a certainty effect, so people give extra weight to an outcome which is certain. And you have the LA and Ellsberg paradoxes, which I won't go into, but they're just a um, uh, series of choices that don't make sense under expected utility theory. So um, people saw all these, uh, th these are all you know, replicated uh, time and time again. Right? Uh, you know, um, yeah. So after after discovering this, you know, people started trying to think of some alternative decision theories, alternatives to expected utility theory, 
So the most famous one is CrossFit theory. Um, you also have regret theory, rank dependent utilities, skew symmetric bilinear utility theory. I have no idea what that is, but it sounded very impressive. Um, but the one I'm going to look at, I'll just explain what it is first and then try to justify why I chose this over all the others. Um, so it was, uh, it comes from a paper by Vescuzzi, Kit Vescuzzi, in 1989. Um, the general idea is that, okay, so in this paper he explains it using lottery exper experiments. So people are given a choice between two lotteries. Either you get this outcome with this probability and this outcome with that probability, or you can choose another lottery where you get you know, other outcomes with other probabilities. So just choices between two lotteries. And th this is the way these um, decision theories are usually tested. This is There's a huge literature on this. Um, these lottery choice experiments, uh, testing all these different uh, decision theories. Uh, so the idea here is that people treat probabilities, the probabilities they're told about these lotteries, as imperfect information, and they use these probabilities to update some prior, uh, some reference probability. And the more reliable you think the information is, the, the more weight you give it relative to your reference um, probability. <clears throat> so you're shown a lottery. OK, there are two possible outcomes. You're going to win or lose. So your reference probability I like to be 50-50. Yeah. Then the, the, you're told, in fact, you're going to win with probability 80%. Uh, yeah. But rather than acting as though you're going to win with probability 80%, you treat this as just imperfect information and update your, your previous belief of 50% uh, by some amount. So that what you actually act on is some probability between 50% and 80%. Closer to 80% if you trust the experimenter and really believe him. Closer to 50% if you're a bit skeptical or um, whatever. So this is the basic idea. It's, it's quite simple. and it, it, it predicts many of the deviations from expected utility theory. So from that example, you should be able to see that how it, how it predicts the underweighting of high probabilities and the overweighting of low probabilities. And then the paper he explains how it can also explain the uh, LA paradox and so on. And one nice thing about this theory is that it actually predicts these deviations from expected utility theory. So something like prospect theory, what it does is it just um, uh, generalizes the utility function. So instead of just having um, you know, one risk aversion parameter, you have like four parameters. So you have a, a different curvature um, depending on whether you're in the gain domain or the loss domain, um, and you also have these weightings on, on probabilities. So um, most of the theories just, just generalize the utility function in order to fit the observed data. This actually predicts these deviations, which is a nice property. Um, it's had mixed success in these lottery choice experiments, so sometimes it's found to perform better than utility, expected utility theory, sometimes not. But of course, this is um, this is talking about objective objective probabilities, where you're told this will happen with this probability, this will happen with this probability. What we're dealing with is a game where um, probabilities are subjective. You have to figure out these probabilities yourself. And what we have are the beliefs, so what people have, have stated themselves. So a closer paper to this is for Susan Evans, uh, 2006. In this paper, workers report the probability of an injury, suffering an injury in the workplace, both before and after seeing a hazard warning on for some chemical. And then they asked how much the, the wage should increase uh, to compensate them for the increased risk. <clears throat> they then go on to uh, estimate the utility function and the behavioral probabilities. So behavioral probabilities are the probabilities that they must have that they, they acted on rather than the ones that they stated. So these are estimated. Um, and they find that the reported probability, so what 
the, the workers said uh, is different from what they actually behaved on and in, in line with this perspective reference theory. So our new hypothesis is based on this idea that the reported beliefs, what they say when we ask them how many people are going to stop out of 12, um, these are derived from introspection. So people, they've got no information from the outside world. They see this game, they have to think about what they, the other person's going to do. They have to think about the game. Um, and the idea is that subjects in the in-group treatment give more weight to these introspective beliefs because they see their partner as being like themselves. So I see this game, I think about what I'm going to do. Uh, and I, this is the probability I report. But how much this actually influences my behavior depends on how much I see my partner as being like myself. So, with me so far? Okay, good. Uh, this is the model. Um, uh, okay, so uh, what we're doing is replacing expected utility with this E expected utility star. So this is the uh, equation from the perspective reference theory. It's, re it's, really, it's really quite simple. Um, this Pij is the, the probability based state. This is what they tell us. Yeah, so this is the introspective belief. Um, Qij is the reference probability. So this is what they, you know, before any consideration of the game, what they think people might do. Okay, so b before any reflection, they see the other person has four, four possible strategies, so we just assume that they um, will place an equal weight on each possible strategy. Um, yep, and so so xi is xj is the this is the relevant payoff. This is your utility of that payoff. We just just assume standard uh, constant relative risk aversion utility function. Um, and you can see that if if these weights uh, alpha and alpha out if they're zero, then you just get back to your expected utility theory. So ex expected utility theory is nested within this model. Um, so alpha, that's the, oh, one minus alpha? No, oh, okay, so alpha is the weight that um, people in the in-group treatment place on their, their um, reference probability. Alpha plus alpha out is the weight that people in the out-group treatment place on their reference probability. So, yeah, if alpha equals alpha out, then you equal yeah, zero. Sorry, this is really what is the probability here? This is the probability of stopping a certain Of stopping at a given mode, yeah. Okay. Okay. And oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, no, 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 it's not, sorry. No, no. <laughs> These probabilities are calculated from, from those, those uh, reported beliefs. Yeah. So obviously you have to multiply these probabilities together. No, I, I should have explained this in more detail. Yeah. So these probabilities are based on um, the reported probabilities about your beliefs about the other person stopping and your future decisions. So I put these together to get uh, a subject of probability of stopping at each given node given the strategy that I've played. And QIJ is the same thing, but assuming that um, the, the probability of all the strategies being chosen by your partner is is one over well, is equal one over four. Yeah. So it, it's um, yeah, it's basically expected utility theory, but with a, with a prior you know, with a sort of a Reference probability and just just taking an average of your uh, your prior belief and your your new belief, your new information based on introspection. Uh, and the theory is, oh no, sorry, I haven't quite finished. Uh, so for the estimations, I assume a logistic choice function. So the probability 
of choosing a given strategy um, is higher if your ex expected utility star, EU star, is higher. So this is a fairly standard um, way of estimating these, these things. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with yeah, basically you've got one extra parameter, lambda, which is the degree of rationality, so, or how sensitive you are to payoff differences. So if, if, if lambda is equal to zero, you just basically, you choose all the strategies with equal probability. As lambda goes to infinity, you best respond. Um, yeah, you, you choose the best response as alpha goes to infinity. So our hypothesis is just that alpha out is greater than zero. That's it. So the weight that um, the weight that people in the out group treatment place on their prior is bigger than in the in group. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, no. Well, it depends on their beliefs. <laughs> uh, yeah, it would depend on your beliefs. As I said before, I mean, if, if, if you believe that the other person is definitely going to continue, then stopping immediately is stupid. Uh, yeah. So I guess a lot, I'm just not getting this at all, and this has a lot of I'm not getting here, but, okay. but before this in and out stuff had a sense of how much you bonded with the person, how much you want sure. to maximize your group. I have that. But this is actually the difference in in and out. Based upon your so-called objective versus your subjective probability, is that correct? Uh, it's very, so the, the, the intuitive idea behind it is you're more certain about the behavior of people who you see as being the same as you. There's a, a people in out groups you 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 don't understand what they're going to do. You're uncertain about their behavior. People in in groups, but it's a, you believe this is, you can this is a very different well, hypothesis. It's completely different. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's almost like you don't belong the same paper. Uh, possibly not. talking about, I mean, very good. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not claiming that this is a test of perspective reference there, yeah, yeah, because yeah. obviously the, the experiment was not designed yeah, for this yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying we got the strange data, and we find that this theory explains it well. So I, I mean, I see this, these results as a springboard to more experiments, mm -hmm. not not as a conclusive proof of anything. Mm -hmm. um, I just, yeah. So you haven't tested this on fresh data yet? No, no. So this is part of my research agenda, is to, you know, we've come up with these interesting results, uh, which we didn't expect, and so um, I want to explore further these, these ideas. Okay, so uh, we can now estimate this, this model. Uh, so the first, this is a maximum likelihood of estimation of these, the, the equations I showed you before. Uh, so if you just look at an expected value model, where you're just maximizing obviously the expected value given your beliefs. Um, we get the, the lambda is significantly different from zero. So this is a this is a relief that people are not just behaving randomly. They do understand the game to some extent. If we throw in a risk aversion parameter, we find this is highly significant, the model is much, much better. Uh, this is quite high, but not outrageously high. So Average. In other studies, this this risk aversion parameter still tends to be between 25 and 65 or something. So this is at the high end of the range. But this is probably related to the game. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why it's so high. Um, if we now look at a prospective reference theory model, throw in this this alpha. So now assuming that you're not acting based on the beliefs you've stated, but some uh, average belief of them and a, and a prior probability. Uh, we find again that the model improves dramatically if you look at the uh, log likelihood uh, value uh, and also this alpha coefficient is highly significant. Throwing in the, the dummy for the out group, again we improve this, this model is better based on a, log, uh, a, a likelihood ratio test. It's better at the 1% model. Um, and we see that alpha for the in group, the, the weight that they put on their prior is almost zero. This means that in the in group treatment, 
people are placing, um, uh, uh, they find their beliefs fully informative. So they have no weight on the prior. What they state is what they what they act on. Whereas for the for the out group, um, alpha is is, high, is is very large and and uh, significant at the five percent level. So this is basically supporting this hypothesis we had before. In the out group group treatment, you um, you see your you find your introspective beliefs. You see them as only partially informative about the behaviour of your partner. In the in group treatment your um, beliefs are seen as fully informative about the behavior of, the, of, of your partner. Yes. And, and the, <clears throat> the reference prior in this is a uniform uh, reference, and then you have your reported probabilities in, in the alpha in the alpha, <clears throat> so the alpha and the alpha in the second last column there are <clears throat> the weights on that, like the point zero one seven is sort of saying, look at I, I um, I'm not putting any weight at all in a uniform distribution, um, yeah. which, is the, which is the QIs yeah. there. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm just trying to make sure. That's so, right. so in fact, uh, players in the in-group uh, treatment are behaving as expected utility maximizers. Yes. Um, yeah. With their, this, with their subjective this, probabilities. This is zero. With their, with their, with their, subjective, with their reported, with the reported probabilities. Yeah. yeah. Whereas people in the out-group are, are not. They're putting a very large weight on that, on that uh, uniform prior. So that's, I mean, that's basically it. I, um, it, it it's this, this model, I think, fits very well the data. It explains it in a sort of intuitive, I mean, it's a very intuitive idea. But um, I think that if, if you're trying to, if you're interacting strategically with someone you see as being like yourself, then your introspection you can see is, is, is relevant and something you want to base decisions upon. If it's someone you see as being very different from you, you don't know what they're going to do, so you know, you're more likely to act as though they um, they're randomizing between you know, between their, their available strategies. So we did a few robustness checks. We looked at a different uh, prior set of different set of reference probabilities. Um, I won't go into the details of that now, but it came up with pretty much the same results. Uh, we also thought, well, maybe. Maybe these, this result here is related to the risk aversion parameter or the, la the lambda parameter. So we, we ran um, the estimations again, allowing for different parameters in the in-group and out-group treatments for the lambda parameter and the risk aversion parameter. As you can see, there's, there's no difference um, in these parameters. And the other the other uh, coefficients remain almost the same, but still highly significant. So it seems to be a fairly robust result. Yep, wrong way. So conclusions. We, we find no evidence that social preferences play a role in the sin to be game. Um, yeah, we're not saying that they don't, we're just saying that we haven't, you know, our setup hasn't shown that they do. Um, a perspective reference theory model shows that subjects playing an in-group playing an in-group member treat introspective beliefs as fully informative, whereas subjects playing an out-group member treat them as only partially informative. And this uncertainty leads to subjects continuing longer in the out-group treatment, even though reported beliefs are unchanged. So, you, um, yeah, I mean, intuitively, this this is is fairly easy to see if. if uh, if, if I think you're equally likely to stop or continue at the next node, I should continue because of the large increase in, in payoffs, the exponential increase. The, uh, the first statement, I don't know if it's okay, but the first statement, you find no evidence that group identity affects social preferences. Yes, which is what I mean. Where social preferences, I mean, because you still observe that many people. Uh, like go and FTP. Yeah. Right? And if you assume that there are these two explanations, one is, hey, I just don't know what I'm doing, I don't know how to solve this thing, right? Uh, I can be confused, or I can, I can have some social preferences, right? So you can still have some social preferences, sure. which are sure. not affected, but, but, but you just don't find evidence that these social preferences are affected by your way. Yeah. yeah. 
So unfortunately, we've got no way to explaining the, the mystery of the centipede game. I still find that a bit totally, totally confusing. Um, yeah, but we do find some interesting things, I think, about uh, group identity. <clears throat> so this is now we're moving from conclusions to discussion. Um, so these are just some thoughts of things that sort of are suggested by these results. So the, the economics literature on identity, it's, it's mostly based on the idea of self-esteem. That You join groups that are successful because that makes you feel better about yourself. Um, yeah, you want to identify with successful groups. And this explains things like altruism because it, it's what's good for the group. Make, it makes them more successful and makes, um, makes you feel better about yourself. So, yeah, pretty much every, every um, economics paper on, on identity, the, the, the social preferences are entered through the utility function. But what, we've, what we find in this experiment is that it, 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 it's more related to uncertainty. And there is a psychological, psychology literature that, that um, sees joining groups not as about self-esteem, but about reducing uncertainty about, about the world. You're into this crazy world and don't know what to do. Um, and so you, you join defined groups and that tells, explains how you should behave in given situations. So it's about reduction of uncertainty. So this is a little bit closer to what, what we're finding. Well, um, what if you think, um, suppose a, some evolutionary perspective, right? That oh. I am part of a group and we cooperate, right? Because I mean, we go have maths and stuff. And so as part of the group, being part of the group reduces uncertainty and unafraid. Maybe because we share, and there is a preferential treatment, some sort of trust, altruism, whatever you within the group, but you just want to limit it within the group so that uh, you wouldn't, your altruism wouldn't get exploited by out group members. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, so in, in that sense, you would be sort of reducing an uncertainty exploitation. I'm not talking about reducing risk. Uh, uh, so you're suggesting that you know people join groups to hunt together because then there's it's kind, mean, of, it's kind of insurance. Well, yeah. That's what the biologists suggest. But this is really uncertain about how, how to behave, what to what to do. And it's, it's back to the you just don't know how those other folks are thinking. Strange, you know, Kandinsky. Um, uh, why doesn't that show up in the in the uh, variance of the beliefs? Well, if you looked at, you know, the you've got your belief distributions there. Yeah. Shouldn't it be? T I mean, I know it's not a clean thing, but it seems like the variance when I'm looking at expectations about outsiders should be more dispersed. Or the, sure. Yeah. But what we elicit is the <clears throat> the mean, and that variance is the variance um, amongst the subjects. So, aren't they related? So the the, the yes. But I mean, I mean, if they're I'm, not, that, that, but, um, that does, I mean, in the way maybe you've collected they're not, it seems like it's another way of providing confirmatory evidence of your estimation stuff. Because you could look at, you know, how do, how do insiders, you know, what does their distribution of beliefs look for yeah. outsiders versus insiders? So this is why I was stuck. This is why I was stuck for so long, because I started out about, <clears throat> well, I sort of got the idea that it was about uncertainty. Yeah. And then I started trying to look at what happens if you increase the variance of, of beliefs, but nothing happens. Mm. If if you think, um, which really wants to so do all, all that matters is your mean belief. The, the variance for behaviour in in an expected utility framework, all that matters is your mean belief. 
not not it, it, everything else is irrelevant because if you when you calculate your expected utilities, um, you just end up with all these compound lotteries that, that collapse, um, and the only thing that's relevant is, is your mean belief. So the variance of, of beliefs in the expected utility framework has no effect in theory on behaviour. But maybe that's true. That, that's why we have to extend it to to. But, this, but it does seem thing. like your um, your explanation, the you know the um, exponential deviation to explain results, is saying that they're placing less certainty. You know, they're, they're more uncertain about what these outcomes are. It's a different do. it's a different kind of uncertainty to, to the sort of uncertainty that you have in, in expected utility theory. Uh -huh. As I said before, and certainly in the sense of, of an increased variance of, um, of of the of the distribution that you draw your um, the, 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 the beliefs the beliefs are, are drawn from, that that will have no impact on behaviour in the expected utility framework, because it just all disappears when you make your, your calculations because you're up with all, all these compound lotteries. And no, I, I, okay, I get that. But what I'm saying is, in this world of the Perspective reference theory. Yeah. In that world, it does make a difference. Yeah. And so, why can't you get confirmatory evidence by looking at the actual belief distributions? And you should find that that people who are like me, I'm I'm assuming that when I go to guess what their behavior will be, they'll be a lot more like what I will do. And the others are just much more. You just though. You could have the same mean for both groups, and you just get really really flat distribution around that mean to the other group, and same on the mean. I I don't know why you'd expect that just on pain. But there's, yeah. um, well, the, the beliefs that I showed you are the reported beliefs, mm -hmm. and if you believe this perspective of reference theory, they're not what they're not what sure. is being acted on. Mm -hmm. The uncertainty comes not from those beliefs, but how much weight you place on them relative mm -hmm. to your prior. That's where the uncertainty is. The uncertainty in, in this world means a higher weight placed on this uniform prior. So it's a different kind of uncertainty to the uncertainty of expected utility theory. And it's necessary to explain this with different actions given different uh, average beliefs. I was yeah. just thinking, for, I mean, this, this ambiguity idea, mm -hmm. Rob, is that in, a, in this perspective of theory model is just saying the thing that I act on is a mixture of something I've reported and some other beautiful distribution that I have. And what you've come up with is, given that that's the model that I'm working with, it's a nice little linear relationship between those two point mm -hmm. distributions, uh, and and the, what you found is that in the, the, there is quite a difference between the in group and out group on that you know with the with, with the in group thing. It's I'm, I'm quite happy with my reported beliefs, and I, I was thinking what Marish was saying about the evolutionary thing. It's like once I've kind of identified, I don't feel I'm going to get. My reported beliefs are kind of guiding my behavior. I feel a little more comfortable than guiding my behavior when I'm dealing with insiders. But when I'm dealing with outsiders, I'm not really so sure whether I should take this, um, uh, my reported beliefs as gospel. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm going to go back to to random things when I, because I don't know anything about these guys. It's, um, so it's, I mean, I think if I was Peter Backer, I'd sort of say, well, we've got to bring in ambiguity here. You know? uh, ambiguity goes in the wrong way. I, that was one of my, that was the second. So the first thing I did was try to look at increasing the variance. Theoretically, what should this do? And it does not. Uh, an expected utility framework. Looking at ambiguity aversion, if, if um, then our group should, if you're less, if, you, if, yeah, if you're ambiguity averse, you should stop earlier. So the greater the ambiguity, the earlier you should stop. I, I, it's, well, uh, I mean, it goes I mean, in the wrong what's, direction. What's the hypothesis about groups and ambiguity aversion? I don't have any yeah. information about that at all. So well, presumably you should be less. Yeah, there should be less ambiguity yeah. about groups. So it works in the wrong direction. This was the second thing I tried to explore. So, um, what does this matter? Okay, so the idea that discrimination can be driven by uncertainty rather than social preferences explains a couple of papers which um, are interesting. I think there was this paper by Grady in 1995. She went to the New York fish market. And found that white fin all the fishmongers are white. They but they charge less to Asian customers for a take it or leave it offer. Also, Ayers, in this 1991 paper, um, he was investigating discrimination in um, secondhand car sales in Boston, not Ch Chicago, somewhere. Um, and he found that that 
his test buyers, they got worse deals from car salespeople if they're of the same gender or race. So, um, well, women and, and African American um, buyers got worse deals from everyone, but it was even more pronounced um, if they were of the same, if the salesperson was of the same ethnicity or, uh, or gender. So, black buyers got the worst deals from black salespeople. Women buyers got the worst deals from, <clears throat> from female um, salespeople. Okay, which makes no sense from uh, the sort of traditional social preference idea that you should be more altruistic towards people who are like you. Okay, but if you think about it in terms of uncertainty, if salespeople are less certain about outgroup's bargaining strategy and the risk of this, then they're going to give better offers to people who are like themselves, so as not to risk rejection. So it sort of makes a bit of sense of, the, of this field data. And it's also uh, relevant to, so whether discrimination is driven by preferences or uncertainty um, ha will have an impact on how best to, to deal with it. So um, in, in Europe, uh, gypsies tend to have very high unemployment rates, and that's uh, incredibly high yeah. in most countries, most countries like 70, 80 percent. And part of this is because employers simply will not hire. Um, so in Spain, they had a, a very successful program subsidizing the wages of employers who would hire gypsies. Um, this is this is what you would, you would expect to need if discrimination is, is driven by preferences. So if you have like the, the I guess the classical model of discrimination in the, in the labor market is uh, Gary Becker's one. Um, where it's modelled as a disutility of working with someone of a different of a, of a different group, like you, you. and so if you believe this kind of model, um, say it costs me five euros worth of disutility um, to work with a, a gypsy, then I have to be subsidised by five euros in order to employ them. Um, whereas if if um, discrimination is driven by uncertainty, so I'm I'm a Spanish employer. I see the Spanish guy, I think I know whether he's going to be lazy or um, steal or whatever. I see a gypsy, I don't know, you know, because I don't know how to read their behavior as well. I'm less certain about their, their strategies. Even if I have the same median or mean, mean belief about the probability they're going to be lazy or, um, or steal, this, if you're risk averse, this greater uncertainty will make it um, less likely that you hire them. And to deal with this, all you have to do is ensure um, employers against bad outcomes. So if things don't work out, then you compensate them for any losses incurred from this, this from hiring this, this person, yeah? which is a lot cheaper, obviously, than subsidising every single um, every single uh, employment. Yeah? And in, obviously in Spain at the moment, the, I don't know what's happened to this program, but uh, you know, given the current budget worries. Uh, I, I doubt it's a high priority. Um, so yeah, if, if discrimination is indeed partly or completely driven by uncertainty, you, know, you have cheaper policies to deal with this in the labour market. So that was one sort of policy application I thought of. Um, yeah, and in general, I don't know, I, I haven't thought really hard about this, so I'm going to be babbling a little bit, but so which decision theory should we use? So I mean, and how do people treat uncertainty? I, I was saying, in this, it really brings up this idea that people are treating uncertainty in a different way than they should in an expected utility framework. I don't know how general this is, and this is part of my um, research agenda for the future: is to look, you know, is this very specific to group identity, or can we learn something about? Um, how people make choices in, in strategic uh, situations in general. So it may depend on the context. Yeah? So in these lottery experiments, prospective reference theory isn't, isn't you know, the pr pr prospect theory seems to perform a lot better in general. It's not a, it's not, it hasn't been hugely successful. Um, but then, you know, maybe that's the wrong uh, context. 
you can see this idea of you know, whether beliefs should have a greater or lesser weight is likely to be more, more relevant, more pronounced in a situation with subjective probabilities. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe in testing decision theories, we should look more at um, at decisions under uncertainty rather than these lottery experiments which people use at the moment. Another question is who best responds and best responds and when. So there are a few experiments looking at uh, whether people with high cognitive ability, usually measured by something like the cognitive reflection test or something. It tends to be found that the, the, the higher cognitive ability people tend to best respond more. But if, if um, we can learn something from, from this data from my experiment, perhaps it should be um, also correlated with people who think they're like other people. Um, so even if I'm very clever, if I think that other people are not like me, then there's no reason why I should play a national equilibrium. What you need is a combination of both people being clever and thinking that other people I like themselves. And I've, I've run a couple of pilot experiments which uh, I found that just this question, um, you know, do you agree or disagree with a statement? I think like other people, I solve problems in the same way that, as other people. Um, this is uh, fairly strongly correlated with um, the propensity to best respond as well. And it is very preliminary. Uh, but even controlling for uh, cognitive ability, you still have this effect of these, these questions. People who see themselves li as like other people tend to best respond more. So, you know, there may be uh, a methodological point for um, experimental economics. If we want to test a theory that assumes common knowledge of rationality, maybe we should aim for very homogeneous subject pools, perhaps. Anyway, that was just a bit of a few thoughts. And things. Uh, any, any questions? Any more questions? Yeah? Uh, what, what was the exact uh, belief you elicited? I, uh, if I was in the in-group trip, would I be asked to guess uh, of those of the same? Same group? treatment and opposite player. So the, the beliefs you're eliciting uh, yeah, about behaviour about behavior of... Um, so, okay. So in each session, there were 12 people who played in an in-group treatment as player two. If you were playing as player one in an in-group, you're asked how many of those people um, chose to, do you think chose to stop? So it's the same same treatment, but opposite player. Right. And uh, did you consider second order beliefs at all? No. No? Um, was there a reason? why you uh, elicited the beliefs after you elicited the uh, the actual play? Yeah, because initially our hypothesis was just to do with actions, and so we, did, we didn't want to sort of, that, that was what we were most interested in, was the actions. So we, we did that first, so as not to contaminate the belief. Um, yeah. But uh, with with normal form games, um, three by three normal form games, they there are a couple of papers that have, have found that it doesn't matter whether you do it before or after. There may be other papers that find that there is an effect of an order effect, um, but I don't know of any. And uh, finally, there's a paper by uh, Dirk Nicholson and Jeff Kirkstein, and they put forward a theory of uh, reciprocity uh, uh, based on uh, if someone performs a kind action to you, you want to reciprocate that. Yeah. And uh, they only do the theory, but one of the games they do investigate is the centipede game. So I'm not sure if you've read that paper or whatnot, it might be good to reference it. Yeah, uh, I, I haven't read it, but my co-author keeps on telling me to. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I should at some point. But I, presumably it would have the same implications. The greater reciprocity would mean continue, continuing longer. Yes, unless you consider the, the fact that someone continued in your 
your own group to be less kind than if someone sure. outside of the group yeah. did it. Like, if a complete stranger does something to you, uh, for you, you might think that is more kind than a friend doing the same thing for you. Yes. Kind of. I mean, that's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, this is true. This is true. There is that. But uh, that's that was was not found to be the case in the Shannon Lee paper. They had a, I mean, they, they had a uh, like a two a biped game. Yeah. So just a, a centipede game with two nodes, and they found that the um, the out people in the out group treatment were more likely to stop, which is the opposite of what we get. But that's still in line with this theory because the, the payoffs were different. There was only a very small gain to be made by continuing. And then if you, if you again, if you're more uncertain and, and the payoff gain is very small, then you should stop. Right? So they got the opposite results in a, in, a, uh, in a game with the same sort of structure, but because of the difference in payoffs, greater uncertainty should lead to you stopping earlier. With the exponential payoffs, greater uncertainty should lead you to continue longer. So actually, yeah, uh, what they find is in line with what we find. But if you just look at it in terms of social preferences, uh, as well, in their, in their case, yeah, there was there was greater reciprocity shown to in groups, not out groups. Well, Daniel, I mean, when, when, when I just try to estimate, um, so in, in in the Gutenberg and Fuchs paper. They mm -hmm. calculate different uh, uh, sequential reciprocity equilibria, mm -hmm. right? depending on the beliefs. And you guys do have beliefs over here, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can calculate the kindness, right? So the kindness is measured as the difference between what your action costs, what pay off your action cost from you, versus what you could have chosen, could have chosen and didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, then, it, it also enters my beliefs about what I think about your action. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you do have some proxy yeah. for that. And so, what actually Daniel says could be, uh, you, you could look at the um, sort of reciprocity and then social preferences. So, we, 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 given the beliefs and the actions, we could estimate the, the degree of social preferences that's right. that are implied. But we're definitely going to get the opposite. We're going to. If we do this, the only thing we can possibly find is that people are kinder towards. Oh no, no, but yeah, yeah, there's this argument about it being unexpected. So, yeah, no, we should do this. Yeah. Right. So I mean, the so the the, the, the classical example for this that um, Asha is closest to me. Suppose I pushed her off the chair. Hmm. Right. How is she going to respond? Is she going to? Is she going to do it? Well, she's <laughs> going to thank me because she might think that. I thought there was going to be an earthquake, and I thought something was going to fall on her, and so mm -hmm. I'm trying to protect her. Or is she just going to think that I'm a jerk, and so she's going to you know, punch me in the face or something? Yeah. Right. So, so, we, so we have, right, it's the beliefs that drive the behavior in this case. And what you observe, I mean, but based on some observable actions. Yeah. So then we have to get into second order beliefs, don't we? Because, yeah. You have to. I need to know your belief about my belief about what you're going to do next. It seems like we're also milking the affiliated the connection with Klee and Kandinsky very far here. It's one thing to expect Robin to be able to be nice to me because we're both from applied econometrics, we're working there for the benefit of Bob. So he would be kinder to me than say, I'm just a jerk in general. Yeah. So, but you know, that we've got some history there that to drive the Bob's expectations about kindness. And, uh, I'm kind of thinking just because you're Kandinsky fan or Klee fan. There's, a, I mean, there's a a massive pile of experimental work showing that, that uh, it's very easy to induce um, favoritism to in groups. Um, I mean, it starts back from the, from the Late like in the 70s with psychologists, but it's been you know, uh, replicated over I'm and over. I'm sure again. you're right, but that's why it makes me more worried about. Maybe there's just something weird about this set of people that you got, right? If you, if you had the, the one stage experiment before you did your stuff, just showing that, yeah, in some kind of standard thing where we were expecting to show in group nice stuff, mm -hmm. they showed in group nice stuff. And then we've got this weird thing that happens afterwards. 
But but I mean it's it, it's been done not just from Kandinsky but also. Oh, I'm not doubting any of that. I wondered when uh, you just got some weirdos that showed up your experiment that day. You well, there, was, it, there are four, four, I would have been on four separate days, and 24 weirdos in each, uh, each session. You, you could two sequences by randomizing the treatment groups, that's sequence random. Oh, it is, it is random. So, so the treatments were, were randomly assigned. Mm -hmm. So I didn't just run the in-group on one day and out-group on the other, I did it in the same session. So it's, it's true randomization of treatments. Oh, there's a very important question. I should probably, we should probably stop it. James must be. Uh, yes, I'll have a point, please. We should, we should go with that. Beer. All right, well, the stage is <laughs>